Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi, and we're going to go backwards a little bit and do another episode where we're having a panel discussion of an article. Um, uh, and I know you probably thought you were done, but you get this bonus episode now. Um, and I've got four intelligent, uh, caring, passionate women on with me to talk about some infant and toddler stuff. And I'm going to let them uh, just introduce themselves. You might have to jump in. I can't point because you're all in different parts of all the screens. So, Laura, go first. Okay, I'll go first. All right. Um, I am Laura Spillman and um, celebrating 35 years in early childhood this year. Woohoo! Um, what a year. I am currently a director for a La Petite Academy. Um, we are a managed care site for one of the hospitals, so we only provide care to hospital employees. Um, that's a fairly small site, but I, I love it so much. But I've had a lot of different a lot of different jobs, so I won't go into all that. It would just take too long. So, but that's me. Okay. Uh, Katrina, can I ask you to go next? Yes. Um, so I'm Katrina Mahasai, and I'm a content specialist for uh, the Professional Development Workforce Innovations Department at Zero to Three. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bethany? I'm Bethany Corey. I'm a family child care provider in Middle Tennessee. Thank you. And Kristen? Hi, I'll round it out. I'm Kristen Green <laughs> from Zero to Three as well. I work with Katrina and I'm a program director in the same department and have, am in my 30th year in the field. Oh. So go Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Her 35th year has really been old. something. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to discuss an article that was published in the Zero to Three journal, um, and Zero to Three has graciously given me a link that I can share. Um, so we'll be posting that when the article or when this podcast comes out. So um, anyone who wants to dig deeper into it can dig deeper into it. But the article is called One Diaper at a Time, Re-Envisioning Diapering T Routines with Infants and Toddlers, and it's written by Deborah E. Lauren um, of Eastern Michigan University. Uh, and, and, and so I, I'm going to try and sum it up really quickly, and then we can jump into things that we felt like were important. Um, but the, the purpose of the article is to look at, specifically at diaper changing, but for the purpose of reimagining how we can use routine times to increase the, um, the quality of our interactions with infants and toddlers, and, um, and, and to have real sort of meaningful relationship building responsive uh, routines and the, the diapering seems like a good example because we do so much of it when we're working with infants and toddlers. Um, so, so in the article, they kind of, they kind of discuss some, um, she discusses some findings that most care in the United States even now is mediocre mediocre or low quality, um, even if they're hitting, um, and even some programs that are hitting those, those benchmarks and standards that states have set, when you look deeply at some of these interactions, there are some things that could be even better, I'll mm -hmm. just say. Um, and so she describes two vignettes of a child care provider diapering, um, changing the diaper of a two-year-old. The first one hits a lot of things that would be on a quality checklist. She's counting. She's talking to the child. She um, gives her a verbal warning. Um, she talks to her about colors and mobiles and things like that, um, which all would probably hit because those benchmarks are like, has conversations during diaper changing, gives warning, is responsive. Um, but in the second example, it just goes so much deeper and she... The, the teacher waits for eye contact or for sort of permission from the child to pick her up and take her um, or to hold her hand and take her. And she, they work together to pull out the steps to climb up mm. the, the steps up to the changing table. And this, this child care provider knows that the child is really interested in gloves. So she lets her play with gloves a little bit and they, they have a warm conversation before any of the diapering stuff even happens. And then, uh, so it's just, it's the same sort of the same checklist kind of activities, but the way and the details make it a little bit richer and deeper in the second vignette. 
Mm-hmm. Um, would, would any of you who have recently read it add anything to that summary that you feel like is important before we go forward? I would, I would just say some of, I think that, I think that an important part I got out of it was that there are, they both were good, like you said, they both hit the marks when it comes to looking at quality, but that one of them really had to do more with the child's experience and then the caregiver's sort of interest in the child. And so Mm -hmm. that whole idea of recognizing children's cues of what of what they're interested in, I thought was really sort of the big takeaway from the second one. Mm-hmm. And then there was just the amazing fact that she said that we somehow like, what was it? 5,000 diapers. That yeah. We will change. Yeah. So like all these opportunities for those one-to-one moments that we all kind of wish for are there, but yeah. quick. Yeah. I talk about that a lot with people who are working with infants and toddlers the sheer number of times that we engage in that activity means that that's an important part of that child's life. It's, it's both in terms of time and experience. And so it's worth taking some time. It may seem like only a diaper change, but it's worth taking some time. I just felt like that, that second vignette had the um, authenticity that um, you would have in a relationship versus Mm -hmm. just this, job of something you have to do so Mm -hmm. it kind of goes to diapering is something you do with a child and not to the child Mm -hmm. and um i one of the activities i did long time ago um is with the infant caregivers is we actually added up how many times just a day that you change the diapers and we sort of averaged it out and it was always really eye-opening. They're like, you know, I think they just get so busy kind of doing this. And it really does become sort of this assembly line routine mm-hmm. kind of thing where, you know, what if you just would slow down and make this more about the relationship building and a more authentic experience, yeah. which is what you see in that that second vignette and making it more natural that she's really talking about the things that are right there, the stair, the gloves, yeah. those are all right there. So mm-hmm. to me, it just has more of, of, of an authentic kind of um, feel to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think for me, my big takeaway from this is gave me a lot of flashbacks to being in the classroom and doing the diaper changing. And it, it, it highlighted for me instances where I've done both, where I was that educator who's working with, uh, um, you know, a group of toddlers. They're all my primaries. I'm the one in charge of changing their diapers. And then there were times after nap time when I would only have two toddlers awake, and we would have that extended time of let's pull the stairs out, let's, you know, pick your own diaper, can Mm -hmm. you tell me whose diaper this is, and kind of go through that whole um, process, and it was really enjoyable when you have those moments, but I also recognized in the first vignette that I, I could kind of see her day, like, This diaper changing happened in the morning right before the kids went down for nap or right after lunch. And the second vignette happened after lunch or late in the afternoon when there was only a few more or a few kids in the room. And yes, it is definitely high quality and something that we should kind of shoot for, aim for in our days, but um, group care is group care it's mm-hmm. a group of kids and I when I first read the vignette I was like oh she did a good job of <laughs> using her words yeah. and in those marks and then I read the second one I was like oh wow that one was really <laughs> slowed down yeah. and um so that that was what um stood out for me and then yeah. the other piece was <clears throat> um they cited Janet Gonzalez Mina and she was a big person in my career when I was just starting out as an educator because she played such a great um, role in, you know, she's a student of Magda and 
she believed in that idea of routines Mm -hmm. are really where learning happens Mm -hmm. and that was maybe just for me that was mind-blowing for me in the beginning that hey these moments when I'm feeding when I'm changing diapers these are the teachable moments not the ones where I'm busy setting stuff up so yeah I think that was one of the biggest things that going through all of that program for infant and toddler care you know back in the back in the day, that really, (laughs) that really was, you know, that whole training in and of itself was very mind blowing for me because I had never thought of infants and toddlers that way, just because I didn't have that experience Mm -hmm. and I didn't have all that information. And that whole idea of, you know, the child is the, you know, they have their own curriculum and they Mm -hmm. have, you know, you capitalize that during all these routines. I was like, Oh my gosh, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, you are spending all your time, you know, diapering and feeding and all of that. And, um, we move through it so quickly and I get it. I get it. I've been there. I've been there as a teacher. I've, I've, I've been there in all capacities. I do understand. Um, it is, it is challenging. Um, and sometimes I think teachers don't really know. Um, sometimes they're just kind of doing it. And I, I don't know if they have the prompts to, to, to say what's going on or something. I don't know if I'm articulating that well, but just knowing what to say while they're diapering. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It takes practice. It's a skill, um, to change our, to change our habit and do it in that way. Um, and I'm going to give Bethany a chance in just a minute because she's just been listening to all of us, but I just wanted to, um, I wanted to, uh, to agree with Katrina that, that, that Janet Gonzalez Mena, um, was mind blowing for me too. I remember that book. It was the caring for, you know, infants, toddlers, and caregivers textbook, on my shelf behind me. Yeah, I've got two different editions right next to me here. And it was an older one. I remember it was green, um, the 90s probably, early 2000s. And uh, yeah, just that whole idea that, because I, and listeners have heard me tell this story. I was an assembly line diaperer. I got through it fast and that's what I was proud of. And that's how I measured my teaching Mm -hmm. um, so that we could get to the real stuff. Um, So that idea that the real stuff is happening during those routines was liberating for me but also just sort of yeah I had to I had to reflect about myself a little bit but. Mm-hmm. the complete mind shift yeah I mean you're like I was the floater the lone summer when I was a fool and worked in a child care center <laughs> <laughs> it was the floater and so I would change all the diapers and I don't have any memory of that except for the bathroom where I was changing the diapers. Like, I don't remember the kids. I don't remember the experience at all. And so when I read the article and I went, oh, this doesn't sound that bad to the first First one. Oh yeah. We all seem to agree. We all, yeah. Yeah. She's doing good stuff. And I'm like, hold on. What's like, I mean, it's not stuff that I would say during a diaper change maybe, but like, okay, she's paying attention to the kid, like points (laughs) for her. Um, But I remember going from the center that summer and then into family childcare wildly and randomly that fall. (laughs) And I fell in love with diaper changing Mm -hmm. and I didn't realize what was happening, but I was just like, we had eight kids and it was me and sometimes the woman that owned that, the business. Mm -hmm. Um, And we had another house next door with another eight kids and a woman running daycare there. And so we'd play outside and I'd sit on the blanket and I'd be like, well, I'll do the diaper changes. And I loved it because I could just (laughs) check out from all of the chaos and hubbub going on outside and just have these moments and get to know the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I don't know from that, I don't even know how it happened, but I, learned about Magda Gerber and resources for infant educators. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wow, like (laughs) we should be paying attention to diaper changes and feeding. And I don't need to worry about all of the other things Mm -hmm. because like uh, Laura said, like the caregiving is the curriculum, like what you're doing in that moment is so important. And I think that 
with like curriculum. I'm doing air quotes for those listening. We need to the a sound effect. So the and not yeah. the no, video no, version. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got the curriculum and the standards and whatever things that our directors make us do or our um, licensors mm -hmm. make us do or whatever. Um, and, and so we think that we've got to get, I've got to get the diapers changed, get the sunscreen on, get them outside or whatever, or like get them to the craft table or get them <laughs> whatever it is we've got to get them to. Yeah. Um, and so when I opened my program here three years ago, and I had four infants and toddlers, I was like, well, like, we're going to change diapers. <laughs> we're gonna eat it. Our curriculum is diaper changing. Yeah. And like, it really would. It would take us all morning to get outside uh -huh. and we'd play outside for a bit. And then it would take us all late morning to get back in <laughs> and, and just like having that permission to change my point of view from I've got to get through these things to just like, mm -hmm. these are the things that we're doing and enjoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the standards, like, you know, what children should know and be able to do. First of all, you're going to look at what your state has around. Is it developmentally appropriate for babies and toddlers? Right. Yes. And, and, and then if it is diapering actually works. Um, because it's talking about relationship building, it's talking about communication, it's talking about language development, it's talking about motor development, all the things that are in that story of, of this teacher um, with the baby and with this toddler. So it is, and, and it's the interactions that matter in that for babies. So yeah. I, I think that, I think that that's what makes this work too, is again, like, yeah, you don't need to like, do the inappropriate, inappropriate, non-developmentally appropriate things with babies because of the standards. It's mm -hmm. the standards should be something that are easily reached through diaper changing. Yeah. yeah. Makes me think of that research that just came out of the University of Michigan on, it's for older children, but they found that um, sitting down for dinner with kindergartners actually do well for their um, cognitive skills mm -hmm. than doing an hour's work of homework. So oh, wow. actually, I mean, it's the same kind of principle of relationship building builds those connections in the brain mm -hmm. um, more than what we traditionally think is academic. I'm doing the air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need, we need that sound effect. Um, so <laughs> what is, it's, it's come up in, in, I think almost everything that, that all of you have, or all of you have touched on this is what I'm trying to say. Um, the idea that you aren't, you don't just somehow know how to do this one day. Like you, you read this and you might think, oh, I want to be more like that second vignette. Although I can be proud of myself for being the first vignette and not a scooper yes. and, you know, just scooping them up from behind and flopping them down and changing them and moving on. Um, and, and so that being sort of a skill. So I want to read a, a quote um, and just get your response to that because I think it fits that thread of our conversation. Um, but I've printed this very small, so I have to pull my glasses <laughs> Um, and it's on page 12 of the article, the second page, uh, but it says a caregiver's attitude experienced by the child through the ab caregiver's ability to pay attention to and interact with a warm tone of voice and smiles and positive responses to a child's interest and bid for social interaction um, might be a good starting point. But so, so what really stood out to me there was the attitude experienced by the child is mm. this. Mm -hmm. um so so I, i'm just curious to hear how you, what you guys think about that or how you respond to that that idea that um maybe all we have to work on is our our attitude and not so much the words we're using or the i have to say i have two of the most amazing infant care and we and we're a small center we only have one infant room one toddler we have a two-year-old room and then we have a room that we call eps and then we have a preschool and pre-k but um, my infant teachers are so amazing. And what I love about them is that they just talk to those babies just 
so it's not forced. It's not, they don't get, you know, it, you know, when you've got eight babies in there and they're ranging from, you know, three months up to eight months, 12 months, you know, it really does. It can get, it can get just really crazy. I mean, you've got crying and you've got, um, you've just got everything. So what I love is that they're so good about being like, I'm going to be with you in just a minute. I know that you're upset and I, I am coming and I can hear them because the front office, their, their room is right behind me and I can go in and help, you know, at any given time. And trust me, I love going in there. I'm like, you need me to get somebody? And they're like, yeah, it's <laughs> but they, um, they're just really good at acknowledging these babies' feelings, you know, that, um, you know, if they're standing at the caregiver's leg crying and they're changing a diaper, they're acknowledging that, you know, and it's not to, just because I've seen it before where they really want that child to stop. It's just acknowledging, hey, I know you're here and I know you're frustrated and I'll be with you and just it, as soon as I can. They're both so good at that. Um, I just, I feel really lucky. I just have two amazing, <laughs> they're so good. Well, I told a group of nannies once, um, I said something, you know, the baby was crying all afternoon, a nanny's, you know, baby that she was taking care of. And I was like, well, just, you know, like the baby I take care of does that too, starting at about four o'clock. And I just, hold her and we go stand by the window and we talk about mama driving home and it takes her 45 minutes to drive home. So mm -hmm. she's on her way and all these things. And they're all like, every single person was like, babies don't understand what you're talking about. This baby's six months old. What are you talking about? And I'm like, they're not going to know unless you're telling them, like, mm -hmm. unless you're having that conversation, they won't ever learn mm -hmm. conversation. Sure. <laughs> well, what is that tone of voice too? Yeah. You know? right. So right. much about their tone and the demeanor and, it's not, um, it's not forced. It's just natural. Yeah. And you're right on developmentally, Bethany. I mean, children's receptive language is so much, comes on so early and, and, and early on with just certain words, hearing you repeatedly say mm -hmm. mama or mom is coming with that soothing voice can absolutely sets yeah. those neural networks bursting. Mm -hmm. And, and, and she, she knows she's on her way especially like you said, because you do it so routinely and so responsibly. So I, I'm with you. I, <laughs> she does understand a lot more than we would, we would, as m many people think. Yeah. Know, that age group. Yeah. 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 And another I, I, example of how that happens during a routine that probably happens every day yeah. and could easily be sort of sped through or ignored uh, because it's inconvenient mm -hmm. or, or different. Right. Um, sometimes we just won't be able to a, take all that time, but when we can, right. we mm -hmm. do. Yeah. but it's like the difference of like, okay, I'm going to, you know, and as a nanny, you're able to do one-on-one -on -one, or if you're in a, a smaller setting, mm -hmm. you know, you might have more freedom, but it's like, instead of, oh, the baby's crying, let me put him in the swing or, oh, the baby's this, you know, let me do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, what else are you going to do? I mean, unless you have eight other crying babies, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray for mirror neurons. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's when I step in. Yeah. Let me hold the baby. What can yeah. I do? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. In, in one of the other sections, this is on page 13 of the article, but she just talks about the intimacy of diapering. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important, and really most of the routine times have an element of intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that means somebody in that interaction is feeling or could be vulnerable and has to completely sort of trust the other. And maybe it's both ways, but it could also just be one way. And I used to do a workshop on routines and I would ask for um, like, or try to use real life examples. And so I asked, I would ask something like, can you think of a time when you were sort of physically dependent on someone else for, for, for getting a need met? And invariably stories of doctor's visits came up or dentist visits. And so then they would talk about the things that made them feel sort of dehumanized in the process and the things that um, that comforted them or helped them sort of feel safe. And that was such a good segue into diapering. 
yeah. with infants and toddlers because we also just don't think about that that vulnerability that they have when they're entrusting you know when they sort of are forced to trust us one of the things that i used to do when i would um, talk about this vulnerability is you know one making sure that they realize that you really have a child in the most vulnerable position when you're diapering them butt up in the and, air holding on to his ankle yeah. right i mean <laughs> yeah absolutely and the other thing too is just that respect piece i'm like and this is just one of my big pet peeves, and I'm sure that those of you who know me probably have heard me say this before, but I mean, I would never announce to a group of people that somebody farted, you know? And <laughs> In a group me. of adults, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't walk behind somebody and pull their pants back and look inside their underwear. Yeah. And, and people laugh about that. But that's what we do. We walk up behind a toddler and say, oh my God, who pooped? And start pulling back diapers. I mean, and, and usually it always gets a good chuckle when I say that, but I'm like, but really think about it. Would you ever do that to anybody else? And if they're like, well, no, well, why wouldn't you? Oh, that's ridiculous. And that, well, okay. Then why is it okay to do that to yeah. an yeah. infant or a toddler? It's just not. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, the mag, that was the Magda message for me when I read the book we were talking about earlier when, you know, that whole idea of, of just coming up behind somebody and scooping them up or saying something like the, the disrespect as a human, you mm -hmm. know, that Heather, you were saying that dehumanizing that we don't, no one's intentionally doing that. Right. I know I never did, but no, when yeah. you pause and think about that, Laura. You're mm -hmm. like, whoa, like, this is all yeah. like mind blow. It was like mind blowing for yeah. me. Like, wow. Right. Like, I mean, and I did it. I know that yeah. I did oh, it. I absolutely. did it as a toddler teacher. I know that I did it, yeah. you know, but that whole awareness piece, you know, mm -hmm. and when I went through all that training, I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, I would just walk up behind kids and wipe their nose mm -hmm. and not yeah. even exactly. go ahead back. Yeah. And not even <laughs> think about it, you know? So yeah. 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 Katrina, we haven't let you jump in. Do you have anything you've been no, waiting to say? No, I was, um, thinking about kind of, this is just bringing back a lot of experience in uh -huh. the classroom with, with toddlers and yeah. just this piece about um, what's really resonating for me is this, the, um, what Bethany was talking about, about shifting how we look at the experience and um, shifting kind of how we go about our routines mm -hmm. and I always think that not only is it enjoyable for the children but it's also enjoyable as an educator when I'm not rushed yeah. when I can take my time with a child and change their diapers or go through that routine or have that one-on-one -on -one. I used to have a little girl she was always the last one to be picked up and she and I would um, clean up the outdoor space together. And those were some of the best memories I have of being an educator. Mm -hmm. And I really got to know her. And I was, we did continuity of care in my program. And I started with her when she was 18 months, all the way to five years old. Oh, and now that she's, <laughs> I don't know, third grade, her mom will still text me pictures of her oh. and she'll still say, oh, she remembers you. And I always, I often think, well, I still remember her. Yeah. time together. So, um, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it's, it's, it's the whole conversation is just making me really nostalgic about oh, yeah. the classroom. So I think uh. it's interesting. So like the, the group I have now, they're all, um, one's going into first grade in the fall and the other three will be going into kindergarten. So I've had them from infant toddler now sending them off to school. And there was a time um, kind of like before, cause I've got a, a new toddler now that started as an infant. So she's kind of joined the group after they were all big kids and, <laughs> and has been tagging along. And um, so it was before she came along and there was like this moment where my husband and I are like, you know, sitting, we've got a step by the back door in the house and we were sitting there and, you know, three or four, you know, there's only four of them. So three or four of them were, couldn't put their shoes on or their coat on or whatever it was when we were going outside. 
And he looked at me, my husband did, and he was like, oh, it's not that they can't do it. It's just that like us doing it for them is how we used to connect. Oh. Like when they do it on their own, they're missing out on that connection time oh, okay. when they get older, right? Like it used to yeah. be this like, you know, if I was zipping up the coat, it was you know, little mm -hmm. nuzzles on their neck mm -hmm. and kisses mm -hmm. on their cheek while I was zipping it up or whatever, silly mm -hmm. something. And so when they were coming back and it, it was just like a light bulb moment of like, oh, it's not, and you know, we could go into the whole preschool thing of yeah. make them do it themselves or right. whatever, you rigor. know, but like, yeah. <laughs> Miss that rigor opportunity. <laughs> right. And That's a different in, podcast. And it's, <laughs> oh, it's been a podcast twice now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bethany. But no, it's fine. I don't care. Um, but it's that brain shift of like, oh, it's not, they can't do it. It's, they miss that connection time yeah. of like that, that warm comfort of help, helping get their shoe on or yeah. you know, just pretending like they couldn't do it just so they can get a little bit of extra mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. You miss that if you're not having those moments early too. Yeah. I miss being with kids every day. <laughs> yeah. We One of come the things, to Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that my um, company did, and I really like it, um, they had this initiative called um, Active Infants Safe Spaces. And, you know, we don't have any more like high chairs or any oh things like that. I mean, just a lot of opportunity for, you know, babies to move. I mean, really cool materials. But one of the things they did, and I really like it, is they have these like flip chart things. And one of them is one stays on the floor and one is by the diaper changing table. And what I like about it is for that teacher who maybe does need a little help kind of starting a conversation or a little help, you know, kind of because um, it doesn't come naturally to everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, these two caregivers that are in there are really awesome, and they don't need the little flip charty thing. But mm -hmm. I do like it for maybe that newer teacher that maybe doesn't have a lot of experience, mm -hmm. and it has all different kinds of topics and things that you can talk about that are relevant to the baby. And it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like academic by any stretch. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of story starters mm -hmm. yeah. and I like it because it's just kind of right there and I think it really helps with maybe those folks that aren't super familiar and then they have one like a great big one that sits on the floor and the children can interact with it and there's all kinds of real pictures and then there's like little bubbles that the teacher can use um, as conversation starters so it's kind of a cool thing yeah I want to jump to um it's a section that starts on 14, but they talk about um, the Piccolo scale based mm -hmm. on parent attachment literature, the strength-based strength approach, um, and, and has also been used in childcare settings, but they outline um, four areas of um that they met that they can use to measure these interactions and um so I, i'd like to just list those four and maybe we could think of examples of how mm -hmm. that might happen during a diaper or another routine time but one is affection one is responsiveness encouragement and teaching mm -hmm. and i think we've talked a lot about affection <laughs> Yeah. But, um, but so what are some ways that that can be real for people who are listening and maybe want to work on their interactions during these routine times? Um, I mean, even just the getting the children to the diapering area, to the bathroom, mm -hmm. to the diaper changing table, you know, you hold their hand, you carry them you actually can begin those conversation and um, just that close proximity. It's, it's, it's so huge, especially in group care when the children, you know, they get very quickly that um, group settings are different than home settings where mm -hmm. mom is just mom and dad or my, my caregivers are just one-on-one -on -one with me or my siblings versus, ooh, there's, 12 of us or there's eight <laughs> of us. So that one-on-one -on -one time and those gentle touches, those close proximity, mm -hmm. I mean, those 
really are ways we show affection that can also be culturally appropriate, you know, how yeah. children, which goes to that next piece about responsiveness, responding to yeah. what the child's cue is. Yeah. Yeah. I look at the, I look at the vignette that the one that was reimagined and I think the example that they use that I would put under responsiveness is knowing that the, the baby loves to pull the sliding stairs out from the cupboard. The teacher opens the door and together they put the stairs in place. Mm -hmm. So that, that responsiveness is, is, is built into an understanding of who that baby is or who that toddler is. And, yeah. and, and that is such a, and, and then that to me, just, I feel that right in the middle of myself as a relationship moment. She sees me. That my teacher sees me. Uh, she knows I love the stairs and pulling them out. Mm -hmm. And that just is just huge for the baby. So I would say that as an example of responsiveness. Yeah, I think for just that, that example, using this, the vignettes, the, the first one, she's counting steps, she's counting fingers on the glove, she's talking about colors. And that's all fine. It's language mm -hmm. input. It's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's talking and modeling. The second one, everything she did was based or said was based on something that she observed in that moment yeah. with that baby. And so while I, that's, I think that's another good way of looking at, you know, that first one wasn't a terrible vignette, but the second one was more responsive. Mm -hmm. Do you that, think that with the, that with the teaching piece that maybe that's why you know, with the, with the doing the colors and the counting and all that, maybe there's an element in that, that teacher that really, and again, it's not awful, yeah. it's not bad, that they're really trying to, to teach, to teach. I'm yeah. using the, the yeah. finger quotes. Yeah. We've all done it now. Well, Katrina, maybe, no, Kristen <laughs> hasn't done a finger quote, but we'll get her before yeah. we're done. And I, I'm trying to think about, um, I think it was Yolanda Torres, at one point was talking about um, infant teachers who want to, and she did do the finger quotes. She was like, they want to teach. Uh -huh. And really it's about the experience with the children mm -hmm. and not necessarily about this, this teaching component that they're learning. Yeah. But it just looks a lot different. Yeah. And they outline, they sort of define the teaching piece. Um, Cognitive stimulation, providing explanations, initiating conversations, joint attention, and shared play. So it's they give us sort of a guideline to rethink um, if that's you know a priority we want to make sure we're hitting during a diaper change or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be uh, letter number counting, color quizzes. It can be because that's not just what teaching is, and that's right. not teaching for babies and toddlers. Right. You know, right. like that's not it. it you know, we use at zero to three, the idea of we're all educators and, and that because we are teaching in that moment, we're teaching how someone, it feels when someone values me and knows who I am and that they care about me. That's the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I'm valued, I'm seen, and mm -hmm. that leads to amazing things. So yeah. it's like redefining teaching yeah. for me. And if you have a really hard nose, somebody coming at you and challenging that idea that that's what teaching is, then you can just point to neural connections and setting <laughs> foundations like for, the, for, a for the things they value. What? That sounds like a good name for a book. Where they're coming at Redefining you? Redefining teaching. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right. Somebody Do write it. Do it, Laura. <laughs> oh, now. Yeah, Laura. Remember, I've that's been 35 years. I'm on the downhill slide, you guys. <laughs> no, you're not. I know what you're saying. <laughs> We're keeping you forever, Laura. Oh, God. <laughs> um, okay, so do you ha does anybody have any final thoughts or things you really wanted to get to from the article that we didn't get to yet? We probably should wrap it up. <laughs> Can I, I'm just going to mention just because of the times that we're in and, and it's been really interesting because all of my teachers now are wearing masks. And that has been... Um, oh, hard with babies. It has mm -hmm. been hard with babies. Um, and, but again, because I have these two amazing caregivers, they do so much eye contact, you mm -hmm. know, and the babies really do want to just, you know, pull those masks right off. But, um, 
you know, so we did talk a little bit and well, not a little bit, a lot about using that eye contact because that has been, you know, I really, it was really hard at first um, for all the teachers to wear masks all the time. Um, and now it's really just second nature. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's been a real, that's something that I'm going to remember you know, in about 20 years when I'm like really old and I'm on one of these things, I'll be like, I remember when we had the COVID <laughs> and we all wore the masks and we took temperatures. Um, <laughs> so no one rem knows what you're talking about then. But uh, yeah. yeah. I, also, we have to do a another podcast where we all use voices like that. <laughs> we we all imagine ourselves what we'll sound like in 20 years and old lady we stay in character so anyway um but i just felt like i wanted to bring that up because it's just been it's just i didn't think it's anything that i would ever see in my lifetime mm -hmm. for sure sure we've had many conversations on our member connect site about specifically this topic and one of the things that i took away from it was um, so one of, you know, one of the great things about zero to threes were interdisciplinary and um, clinicians posted about the clear masks that European NICUs use mm -hmm. for exactly that same reason of oh, wow. they want to provide as much facial expression mm -hmm. to babies who are in the NICU and have to be there for an extended period of time and because of their health everybody has to wear masks. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's like a clear covering around, around the nose mouth area and like a very thin border of cloth and it's protecting the, um, the nurses and the um, health professionals, but it's also giving kind of that um, connection. And I know a lot of special education and um, occupational therapists, speech therapists are using that because you actually have to show yeah. your mouth in speech therapy. Yeah, yeah. So that's was, part of the PPE for our right. going back in the fall because all our children are there to get speech therapy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow, what, like, what a full circle moment that mm -hmm. um, this part of early childhood child development where not a lot of recognition was given and now we're turning to special education and um, kind of the mm -hmm. special services that we provide, the interventions that we provide and having them lead the way to. So yeah. I think it, I'm looking at it as a kind of a, a turning point of more collaboration and kind of um, the connections within the services we provide children. But you're right, Laura, this feels like something we would never have to think about and now we're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, one thing I wanna say is, um, so having been in the field for 30 years and worked in an infant and early childhood mental health setting for much of that as an early childhood special educator, um, I, I wanna just say anyone who reads the article that I really want to emphasize that both of those scenarios are good enough mm -hmm. and and that teacher is really working to think about that child and caring mm -hmm. and the role of infant mental health is to help us maybe have a little different lens a different perspective and I think that's what this gives us but I also want to acknowledge that I say this is that this is what that authentic experience that relationship based experience is an early childhood educator expertise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong only to infant mental health specialists like Bethany, mm -hmm. Katrina, Laura, Heather. We all understand that article as being educators. And mm -hmm. I take real pride in that. Mm -hmm. And I really think it's part of, I want anyone listening to this to recognize that this is our knowledge mm -hmm. and as well. And, um, that it's not something extra that we're learning from somebody else. This lens was really helpful, mm -hmm. um, but own this as who we are as educators. Yes. Sorry, a little, no, little thank you. there. No, that, I, was, oh, that, yeah, was, that was very great. well stated. Yeah, top that, Bethany. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, I think that's a great place for us All to right, wrap Bethany. this up then. Thank you, Kristen, for that. No, really, honestly, that was great. Yeah. A great way to end this. So All thank right. you all for being here to talk about this, this article with me. 
And um, thanks everybody for listening. I hope you'll come back for another episode. Bye. Thank you. Bye.